Hello, friends. Welcome to episode four of Ents and Sensibility, the podcast for Jane Austen lovers and nerds who love bold, witty women, awkward, handsome men, and dragons. I'm your host, Casey Meserve. Together, we'll read Austen's published works and discuss the major themes running through each of them. We'll also take time to talk about Austen criticism, her earliest fans, her place as an author in the 21st century, and as much nerddom as we can get away with. Today, we'll be reading Chapter 4 of Sense and Sensibility. But before we get started, there are a few pieces of Austen-related news that I'd like to cover. In Austen News Today, Charlotte and Sydney may get a chance to live happily ever after, after all. There are rumors that Sanditon Season 2 is beginning the production process. According to Film Daily, Sanditon's production company has leased office space and there is a call for actors in the UK for a Sanditon 2. Fans of the Sexy Regency series have been clamoring for a season two since the final episode aired, and in February 2020 started an online petition and the hashtag SaveSanditon social media campaign. Let's hope the Sanditon sisterhood can claim victory in 2021. In other film industry news, Amazon Studios and DeNovi Pictures have acquired the rights to Rachel Givney's novel, Jane in Love, that will make Jane Austen an on-screen heroine, according to Deadline. In the novel Jane in Love, Jane Austen strikes a Faustian bargain to find love and ends up time-traveling from 1803 to the 21st century, where she meets and falls in love with a modern man. But her newfound love causes all of Jane's famous novels to disappear, forcing her to decide between staying in the 21st century, where she's found love, but has lost the ability to write or return to her own time will she write her books and become Jane Austen. Finally tonight, the Jane Austen massive multiplayer online role-playing game, Ever Jane, has been shut down. The game was created in a Kickstarter campaign by creator Three Turn Productions in 2013. The game of social climbing, gossip, and balls has gone through several betas, and there were plans for a full release in late 2020. Alas, 2020 has claimed another victim. The developers attempted to keep the game servers running by asking players to sign up for a subscription, but they weren't able to drum up the $500 per month needed to pay for the game servers. The developers announced at the beginning of December that the game would shut down before the end of the month. But all hope may not be lost. The developer says, as of now, the game is for sale. Please contact customer service if you would like to make a query. The game needs an heiress to rescue it or something. This concludes Austin News today. I wanted to talk a little bit about something that I was able to do this past weekend. I was able to attend Lucy Worsley's illustrated talk on her book, Jane Austen at Home, and it will air again January 30th. So if you're listening to this prior to January 30th, 2021, folks, if you can afford the 12 pound ticket, I highly recommend this talk. It was really amazing. I got a VIP ticket, which cost me um, about $43 American, and it comes with a signed copy of Jane Austen at Home, and I am so excited to get it in four to six weeks or longer. Well, I don't want to spoil the talk for you if you haven't heard it. Because it's an only an hour long, it's really touching. I do want to point out a few things that she does bring up. Worsley focused on how small Jane's life really was, how confined she was, and how hard she had to work on her family's farm, and the small spaces she was allowed for herself in her first home at Steventon, the cramped lodgings in Bath and Lyme and Southampton, and finally the cramped cottage that her wealthy brother Edward gave to his mother and sisters in Chaunton. Through it all, Jane's personality was caustic and funny and sometimes tasteless. And all of this helped her get past five love interests, all of the things that happened inside her family, and to make jokes about it. In all, it's a lovely talk, and if you're not interested in getting the autographed copy of the book, it's not that expensive. 
I'll leave a link to it on my social media pages. Again, it's going to stream on January 30th, 20th, uh, 2021 at 6 p.m. Greenwich time. Now on to today's reading. In our last chapter, we learned that Mrs. Dashwood is basically a golden retriever and Edward Ferris is a hobbit. Just kidding. Mostly. Mrs. Dashwood has come out of full mourning and has taken more of an interest in her daughters and her future. She noticed that Eleanor has taken a shine to Edward and decides that they will be married soon. So she decides that she's going to like him and makes an effort to get to know him. Marianne, on the other hand, can't understand why Eleanor would fall in love with Edward when he can't properly recite Cooper and doesn't have any art expertise. Marianne explains to her mother how she can never love anyone who doesn't love exactly the same things she does and have the same opinions as she. Edward is so quiet and reserved, he has no interest in the plans of his mother and sister for barouches or parliament. All he really wants is is a seat by the fire and the kettle beginning to sing. Now we're on to chapter four, and Marianne is voicing her concerns about Edward's, um, lack of passionate feelings. What a pity it is, Eleanor, said Marianne, that Edward should have no taste for drawing. No taste for drawing, replied Eleanor. Why should you think so? He does not draw himself, indeed, but he has great pleasure in seeing the performance of other people, and I assure you he is by no means deficient in natural taste, though he has not had the opportunities of improving it. Had he ever been in the way of learning, I think he would have drawn very well. He distrusts his own judgment in such matters so much that he is always unwilling to give his opinion on any picture. But he has an innate propriety and simplicity of taste, which in general directs him perfectly right. Marianne was afraid of offending and said no more on the subject, but the kind of approbation which Eleanor described as exciting in him by the drawing of other people was very far from the rapturous delight which, in her opinion, could alone be called taste. Yet though smiling within herself at the mistake, she honored her sister for the blind partiality to Edward which it produced. I hope, Marianne, continued Eleanor, you do not consider him as deficient in general taste. Indeed, I think I may say that you cannot, for your behavior to him is perfectly cordial, and if that were your opinion, I'm sure you could never be civil to him. Eleanor is amused by Marianne's opinion that that Edward cannot have taste because he is not so rapturous about his opinions as she would want him to be. And I can't help but think that she's smiling when Marianne brings this up. Eleanor knows how Marianne thinks, so she's musing that Marianne would be uncivil to anyone who is deficient in general tastes, and point out that she acts so cordially towards Edward, so she must think Edward's pretty great. Marianne doesn't pick up Eleanor's subtle tease here, and instead thinks about how she can't voice her real opinions about Edward to her sister. And at the same time, she can't voice them to Edward while he's a visitor. And she's also a visitor in her former home because that would just cause trouble. Instead, she doesn't quite know what to say. Later in the novel, Marion will claim that she's always open about her opinions, but we're seeing here that that's not the case. So she's saying that she really hasn't had the chance to get to know Edward and maybe he does somehow have some attributes. Do not be offended, Eleanor, if my praise of him is not in everything equal to your sense of his merits. I have not had so many opportunities of estimating the minuter propensities of his mind, his inclinations, and tastes as you have. But I have the highest opinion in the world of his goodness and sense. I think him everything that is worthy and amiable. I am sure, replied Eleanor with a smile, that his dearest friends could not be dissatisfied with such commendation as that. I do not perceive how you could express yourself more warmly. Marian was rejoiced to find her sister so easily pleased. Then Eleanor, like every girl with a crush, jumps on the opportunity to talk about the boy, and she goes on this soliloquy about Edward. 
Of his sense and goodness, continued Eleanor, no one can, I think, be in doubt, who has seen him often enough to engage him in unreserved conversation. The excellence of his understanding and his principles can be concealed only by that shyness which too often keeps him silent. You know enough of him to do justice to his solid worth, but of his minuter propensities, as you call him, you have from peculiar circumstances been kept more ignorant than myself. He and I have been at times thrown a good deal together, while you have been wholly engrossed on the most affectionate principle of my mother. I have seen a great deal of him, has studied his sentiments and heard his opinion on subjects of literature and taste, and upon the whole, I venture to pronounce that his mind is well informed, his enjoyment of books exceedingly great, his imagination lively, his observation just and correct, and his taste delicate and pure. His abilities in every respect improve as much upon acquaintance as his manners in person. At first sight, his address is certainly not striking, and his person can hardly be called handsome till the expression of his eyes, which are uncommonly good, and the general sweetness of his countenance is perceived. At present I know him so well, I think him really handsome, or at least almost so. What say you, Marianne? Even Eleanor can't say that Edward is really handsome, which is so funny when you see some of the movie versions and TV versions of Edward, who is played by actors like Hugh Grant. But the book version of Edward is not a babe. He He's not even good looking, but he becomes more so upon knowing him. He's not a social butterfly. His address isn't attractive. You, you have to work to get to know him before he becomes more open and friendly with you. But once you get to know him, the shyness that is considered a fault disappears and you find that he's an intelligent and principled, cultured young man whom you can almost call handsome. Marianne says that she will call him handsome when Eleanor announces their engagement, but not before. Now this really surprises Eleanor right out of her crush reverie. She can't believe that her sister, and therefore obviously her mother, think that she and Edward are that close to being married. I do not attempt to deny, said she, that I think very highly of him, that I greatly esteem him, that I like him. Marian here burst forth with indignation. Esteem him? Like him? Cold-hearted Eleanor? Oh, worse than cold-hearted. Ashamed to be otherwise. Use those words again, and I will leave the room this moment. Eleanor could not help laughing. Excuse me, said she, and be assured that I meant no offense to you by speaking in so quiet a way of my own feelings. Believe them to be stronger than I have declared. Believe them, in short, to be such as his merit and the suspicion. The hope of his affection for me may warrant without imprudence or folly. But further than this you must not believe. I am by no means assured of his regard for me. There are moments when the extent of it seems doubtful, until his sentiments are fully known, you cannot wonder at my wishing to avoid any encouragement of my own partiality by believing or calling it more than it is. In my heart, I feel little, scarcely any doubt of his preference, but there are other points to be considered besides his inclination. He is very far from being independent. What his mother really is, we cannot know, but from Fanny's occasional mention of her conduct and opinions, we have never been disposed to think her amiable, and I am very much mistaken if Edward is not himself aware that there could be many difficulties in his way if he were to wish to marry a woman who had not either a great fortune or high rank. Poor Eleanor. She's really not sure about anything. Edward has a lot of problems that Eleanor believes prevent him from asking for her hand. For one thing, there's that mother of his, whom we haven't met yet, but if Fanny is any representation, that she's not going to be a, a pleasant woman. She wants him to be in Parliament or drive a barouche. He has no money currently and can't ask for it from his mother without following her dictates, which means that he'd have to 
at least drive the barouche. But there's something else here, too, that she can't put her finger on. The want of spirits that seems to mean something, but she's not quite sure what. To the point that sometimes she thinks they'll only ever be friends. Marianne can't believe how far off she and her mother's thoughts have been about Eleanor's engagement, or supposed engagement. And you really are not engaged to him, said she, yet it certainly soon will happen. But two advantages will proceed from this delay. I shall not lose you so soon, and Edward will have greater opportunity of improving that natural taste for your favorite pursuit which must be so indispensably necessary for your future felicity. Oh, if he should be so far stimulated by your genius as to learn to draw himself, how delightful it would be. Eleanor had given her real opinion to her sister. She could not consider her partiality for Edward in so prosperous a state as Marianne had believed it. There was, at times, a want of spirits about him which, if it did not denote indifference, spoke of something almost as unpromising. A doubt of her regard, which, supposing him to feel it, need not give him more than inquietude. It would not be likely to produce that dejection of mind which frequently attended him. A more reasonable cause might be found in the dependent situation which forbade the indulgence of his affection. Finally, his sister Fanny notices their growing relationship, or friendship, or whatever it is. And she's not only rude to Eleanor, but she goes straight to Mrs. Dashwood to specifically express her brother's great expectations. She took the first opportunity of affronting her mother-in-law on the occasion, talking to her so expressly of her brother's great expectations of Mrs. Ferrer's resolution that both her sons should marry well and of the danger attending any young woman who attempted to draw him in that mrs dashwood could neither pretend to be unconscious nor endeavor to be calm she gave her answer which marked her contempt and instantly left the room resolving that whatever may be the inconvenience or expense of so sudden a removal her beloved eleanor should not be exposed another week to such insinuations. Good old Mrs. D defending her daughter. She is furious. She finally has the chance to say exactly what she thinks of Fanny. I wish Jane had told us what Mrs. D said to Fanny because with her temper, I bet it was glorious. It marked her contempt for Fanny after six months of dealing with this woman who intruded on her grief and her period of mourning and threw her out of her own home. She finally has that chance to defend her daughter and tell her what she really means. But now she's got to leave. She won't stay in New Orleans no matter how much the place means to her. Fanny has ruined it. Her daughters come first, even before Norland. Mrs. Deed gets a bad rap from a lot of people, but I love her. She is so loyal. She is so kind and generous. And uh, my heart just goes out to Mrs. D. She, she is having a really, really hard year. I love her. To quit the neighborhood of Norland was no longer an evil. It was an object of desire. It was a blessing in comparison to the misery of continuing her daughter-in-law's guest. People say a lot of things about Mrs. D. She may not have had a lot of common sense, but she's such a good mom to her girls. And at that moment, Mrs. D. gets a letter. In this state of her spirits, a letter was delivered to her from the post, which contained a proposal particularly well-timed. It was the offer of a small house on very easy terms, belonging to a relation of hers, a gentleman of consequence and property in Devonshire. The letter was from this gentleman himself and written in the true spirit of friendly accommodation. He understood she was in need of a dwelling, and though the house he offered her was merely a cottage, he assured her that everything should be done to it which she might think necessary if the situation pleased her. He earnestly pressed her, after giving the particulars of the house and garden to come with her daughters to Barton Park, the place of his own residence, from whence she might judge herself whether Barton Cottage, 
for the houses were in the same parish, could by any alteration be made comfortable to her. He seemed really anxious to accommodate them, and the whole of his letter was written in so friendly a style as could not fail of giving pleasure to his cousin, more especially at a moment when she was suffering under the cold and unfeeling behavior of her nearest connections. She needed no time for deliberation or inquiry. Her resolution was formed as she read. The situation of Barton, in a country so far distant from Sussex as Devonshire, which but a few hours before would have been sufficient objection to outweigh every possible advantage belonging to the place, was now its first recommendation. To quit the neighborhood of Norland was no longer an evil. It was an object of desire. It was a blessing in comparison to the misery of continuing her daughter-in-law's guest. To remove forever from that beloved place would be less painful than to inhabit or visit while such a woman was its mistress. She instantly wrote Sir John Middleton her acknowledgment of his kindness and her acceptance of his proposal, and then hastened to show both letters to her daughters, that she might be secure of her, their approbation before her answer was sent. Eleanor had always thought it would be more prudent for them to settle at some distance from Norland than immediately amongst their present acquaintance. On that head, therefore, it was not for her to oppose her mother's intentions of removing into Devonshire. The house, too, as described by Sir John, was on so simple a scale, and the rent so uncommonly moderate, as to leave her no right of objection on either point, and therefore, though it was not a plan which brought any charm to her fancy, though it was a removal from the vicinity of Norland beyond her wishes, she made no attempt to dissuade her mother from sending her letter of acquiescence. Perfect timing, Sir John. Mrs. D. doesn't even get through the entire letter before she's deciding to take him up on the offer. A few hours before, she wouldn't even consider it, but oh, how things have changed. She writes back to him instantly, which isn't surprising considering her feelings. But she does, as normal, rely on Eleanor's opinion before making a major decision. Luckily, Eleanor is all for leaving Norland behind. The house is simple and the rent is cheap, and so it's a really good deal. So she can't say no, even if it does mean leaving Edward behind too. Well, folks, it's taken four chapters, but we are finally ready to begin the real story. Are you ready? Folks, hang around a little bit because I want to announce a new segment. I've actually received a letter. So here's our new segment, The Writing Desk. Today we received a letter from Anne-Marie in Colorado. Dear Ms. Meserve, could you comment on the lack of a period when Austin writes the word Miss, Mrs., or Mr.? Is the period we see today after each title a modern convention? That's a great question, Anne-Marie. I've noticed this lack of a period as well, and not just in Austin. I've noticed it in several British publications and in the Harry Potter books I bought when I was in England. Now, I looked this up in a few places, and I found that it's very common in British English. I found this note on the University of Sussex's website on a page about punctuation. British usage favors omitting the full stop in abbreviations which include the first and last letter of a single word, such as Mr., Mrs., Ms., Doctor, and Street. American usage prefers Mr. period, Mrs. period, Ms. period, Dr. period, and Street period with full stops. Thank you, Anne-Marie, for your letter, and I hope this answers your question. I love getting letters from fans of this podcast, um, and I love talking with people on social media. If you have a question or comment, you can write to me at entsandsensibility at gmail.com and I'll do my best to answer your question on the show. You can also leave me a note on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. That's all for today. Thank you for listening to Ends and Sensibility. This episode was written and produced by me, Casey Meserve. You can follow Ends and Sensibility on Facebook and on Instagram and on Twitter. You can also leave a review of the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening. Check out my website, Ents and Sensibility, that's E-N-T-S and Sensibility dot com for episode notes, a list of books and references mentioned on the podcast, and more.
Thank you for joining me, and I hope you'll visit again soon.